Hey everyone, uh, welcome to SaaS live sessions. I'm your host, Anna Dana, head of growth at SaaS Group. Uh, Serial Acquire buying wonderful SaaS businesses, by the way, mostly POG businesses. So this session is incredibly interesting for us. Uh, and here I talk with uh, SaaS experts about all the things happening in the industry to bring more value to founders and help them get their products to the next level. And with me today is Wes Bush, the godfather of POG. CEO of Product Led, helping founders build successful product led businesses. Super excited to um, see you here, Wes. Thank you for making the time. Awesome. Thanks. Excited to be here. I feel like Godfather of PLG. I'm like, am I that guy who like kills people or something? <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> yeah. I'm going to edit this episode, you know, in the ambience of of godfather so it's gonna be awesome cool. all right <laughs> so like i said uh great to see you here and for us at sales group i mean when everyone knew that you're coming to to the session everyone got super excited because like i said we acquire uh product-led uh businesses and uh 2023 has been well, should I say turbulent for those, all right? I mean, for everyone, mm -hmm. but but PLG, you really had to uh, nail that uh, to succeed. So uh, before we go any further, could you maybe talk a bit about yourself, right? What's your background? How did you got fathered <laughs> PLG? <laughs> <laughs> Totally. To be a godfather, you got to do something before other people do it. Uh, so yeah, that's my initial foray into PLG before it was even called that. Uh, it was about eight years ago. I was working at this company called Vidyard and they were like this video marketing uh, intelligence platform. So like I could see like if you watched a video on our site and I could see like, oh yeah, you watch 50% of our video or anything like that. We'd feed into our marketing automation platform. We'd get some cool stats on that. And then uh, we realized when we launched this free trial uh, for this company, we were about like 50 people. So it was like, like over eight figures in revenue. And then we launched this free trial and it just like, didn't click. It didn't work. And we're like, huh, uh, all these other companies are doing like PLG for us called that. Um, but it, it didn't work for us. And then about six months after that, we kind of like scrapped that free trial. We're like, let's try again. Maybe there was just our execution was bad. And uh, we launched this freemium model and it, it just took off. Like there was hundred thousand people use it for 12 months. Then there was millions of people have used it. Uh, like there's Loom and everybody's heard of kind of like Loom, but like Vidyard uh, for the free version in the sales space, it's, it's way more strong and prevalent in that space. So I was like, that's awesome. That kind of was my like PLG aha moment of like, wow, um, you know what? We could do this sales led path and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars basically promoting these white papers and guides. Um, and then at the end of like every one of those guides, it's like, hey, um, <laughs> do you want a demo of our product and, and see what we could do with this? And I was like, why don't we just skip that whole process and <laughs> get people the product, see if they like it and go from there. And so over the last seven years, what I've been working with is hundreds of different product led B2B SaaS companies to find and identify is there a repeatable pattern to how you can actually scale and grow a product led business and so that's really what excites me i, I love uh, identifying those patterns and finding a way where it's like how do we increase our odds of really seeing success as a product led business okay that's fascinating all right but well you know uh and don't get me wrong but um sometimes when you and I've heard this story, right? Uh, you listen to it and you're like, okay, so is PLG just, you know, adding freemium to the product? Like, what is it, right? So what, it, and uh, I think that the, there are a lot of um, blog posts that are called, is PLG like freemium or like free trial and stuff. Uh, so what is actually PLG, right? Uh, why is everyone so excited about it, especially right now? And what are the pillars of it? Yeah, no, definitely. So PLG is like a complete go-to market motion for your business. And so, yeah, initially, like <laughs> seven years ago, I thought it was just that like, oh, it's just a free trial, freemium motion. Um, that's all there is to it. But what I've realized is when you do make that big shift where you have that free model, 
it should change a lot of other things in your business in order to be successful. So for instance, your acquisition, like how do you acquire people? Uh, that also changes. So instead of like promoting your demo as kind of your main offer, you're like incentivizing a lot more people to sign up for your free offer to go through that. Uh, depending on what your pricing is, that might mean you do have to prioritize maybe some like less expensive marketing channels because your initial like average contract value is lower. So like it, it changes that on the acquisition side for the engagement side it's like, as far as how do you get people to value? This is one of those things that a lot of companies underplay and don't quite understand where it's like, oh, uh, they just think we'll launch the free model. It'll work. <laughs> what they don't realize, but they know to their own personal stories. Like whenever I ask people, I'm like, what did you do the last time you couldn't get to value in a new product you used? They're all like, oh, I just uninstalled it. I, I didn't go back to it. And then <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, that applies to our product too. And that's their like, oh yeah, that's important thing. Uh, so yeah, that's the other second big piece of your go to market engine, which is like engagement. How do you really um, prioritize that? How do you get more people to uh, value in your product quickly? Um, not just like, oh yeah, they'll get to it eventually. It's like, it has to be quick because people's attention spans are short. Uh, the last kind of big piece of your go to market promotion is just monetization. So what changes there? Uh, that's a lot of times for companies, it's your pricing has to be public upfront. Um, that's kind of like level one. <laughs> level two is more like, oh, you have like value metrics that scale as people get more value. So maybe it starts off with charging somebody like $50 per month. Uh, but could that expand if they got a ton of value out of your product to something like $5,000 per month? Um, do you have that kind of bandwidth? So. Um, those are the three pillars of a, a go-to-market motion and PLG impacts all of them. And so that's really what I, I suggest when I'm like, yeah, PLG, it, it's more than a trial or a free kind of version of the product. It impacts your whole go-to-market motion. Right. Absolutely. But uh, you uh, actually touched upon like a very valid point, right? A lot of companies and a lot of founders that want to do PLG uh, think that it's kind of like build it and forget it, people will come. The product is there. It's supposed to sell itself, right? So um, is it is it for everyone, right? What, what are the companies that should absolutely do PLG and other types of companies that, you know, probably shouldn't? Maybe it's, it's better to start with sales. Uh, and I mean, I also think there is uh, absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? You can add one to another. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, what's your take on it? Yeah. Before I, I answer that, I want to like talk a bit about like real quick, a uh, macro trend that relates totally to this. So I feel like SAS maybe 1.0 was all about like, can we create a specific SAS solution that solves a very specific problem? And that was like, wow, your SAS does that stage. That's amazing. And it's like, it's expensive. It does a lot of these things and it, it takes a while to kind of onboard set up. Now, like SAS 2.0, which is where I feel like we're headed uh, and already a part of right now is like, okay, it's not so much about can your SAS do it? Because the number of SAS companies for every single category is just astronomical. Like if looking back, even like a decade ago, we would be like, oh, wow, there's going to be that many solutions for live chat. Holy cow, <laughs> who would have known? Um, but like, that's crazy. Now it's like, we're at the stage of like, okay, like how easy is it? Can I get set up? Uh, it's less about like, oh, can you do that? People's expectations have like skyrocketed. SaaS has become way easier to build. Now it's a lot about like, can we make it super easy? And so back to your question of should companies become product led? I think you have to start with the assumption of the blue oceans in SaaS are quickly evaporating. So in like a, a blue ocean, which is like an uncontested market space where you're the only one doing that thing, uh, those are getting blown up. And maybe you have a year or two uh, where it's like, oh yeah, we're the only ones that do this. And then you're gonna get a lot of people uh, copying you if it's actually a good market uh, in that space. And so I think the question you have to ask, ask yourself is which go-to-market motion do you want to have in a red ocean, something where it's competitive, there's a lot of players out there. And 
I'm a betting man. <laughs> and I would say that if I was to win and increase my odds of winning in a competitive marketplace, I would absolutely 100% have a product led go to market motion because one, it's more capital efficient. Two, it scales faster. Three, it's like you get your users what they want and they also self serve. So it makes your whole business a lot more efficient. You can serve more people and you can actually build more of a competitive advantage around your product, not your sales team, which I think is a really big thing because it's like, okay, uh, that is a very sustainable way to, to grow and scale your business. So um, that's really what I would say. You're going to get a red ocean one way or another if you're in a good market <laughs> that does become yeah. competitive. So why not have the best go to market motion to scale? Okay, interesting. All right, but uh, since you know uh, at the very beginning you you were talking about the fact that yeah, so usually uh, PLG products are priced a little bit differently, right? And you have to like know if there is this bandwidth. But uh, and on that point, like some may argue that um, you cannot really go and, and scale. And, you know, the session is called "Can you scale uh, to eight figures with PLG?" Uh, some may argue that it may not be possible without sales that like added to the mix at least. So um, how do you fight that? Like, is there um, a way to do that with purely P PLG? Yeah, no, definitely. Like there, there is a lot of like PLG examples where it's like it can go to eight figures and beyond. Uh, but what you're seeing like is a lot more common is like you have some sort of hybrid mix, which is uh, like I see that as being the most common approach to get to 10 mil um, in that sense. So yeah, you will oftentimes straddle like one or two approaches. Not always, I mean, like there was Canva that got like billion plus ARR and it was like, oh yeah, it's just the self-serve motion for the most part. And then they layered more on the team's side of things too. So uh, yeah, you'll have that kind of balance of utilizing them both. But what I think the important distinction is, is what do you lead with? And so in a sales led company, I have a lot of these founders come to me uh, where they're like, oh, I'm interested in like joining your program because we're at one mil or we're at two mil or we're at three mil and we've done the sales led thing. And the founder <laughs> is like scared of, I am like, they finally see, they get it. Like they got the sales led motion down, they got it. But then they're like, oh man, I'm already at like 30 people to get to like 10 mil. This business is going to be crazy. It's going to be 150 people to just hit that. And we're going to have all these different layers of management. Our sales team is going to be like X amount of headcount, the majority in most cases to, to get to that, because once the software is built, it's about selling it. Um, and so they're just kind of like, oh man, like this looks like a very hard way to scale um, that specific business. And so what I always recommend, and I love when I see founders kind of take maybe the slower approach to growth and initially with the product in motion is like you get to one or two, three mil, and you start to get a lot of great traction with your business. And then you can start to, to explore like potentially layering on uh, more of like an enterprise plan or something that people reach out and kind of doing that a bit more uh, reactively and then proactively later on when you're like, okay, we're going to in be intentional about this, but not go like full hog <laughs> on the enterprise stage. Um, but the trap I see a lot of companies get in the early stage is they try and like cater to both markets. And the enterprise folks usually have a lot of different nuanced needs and like advanced problems that they need solved in the product. And so, uh, yeah, that product -like company could get distracted, like developing all that stuff. And then they lose out on like the S and B kind of market and they just end up having a complex product, which is yeah, a slippery slope. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I know. I mean, uh, so many discussions on the podcast about that because, uh, some, some founders say, Hey, we started, you know, we started really small. We started serving SMBs. We started serving other, uh, startups and, you know, we intentionally grew really sustainably. Um, but you know, the market is not getting any, uh, better this year's. Uh, so they were like, oh, maybe we missed an opportunity. there, turning down those enterprise customers, um, because we could be. Uh, moving a little faster. But on the other hand, there were founders here on the podcast who said the totally opposite, like uh, what you just said, 
we we did start building with our development uh, developer customers right um together ultimately becoming almost like a feature to like what they um what they were initially having there and that yeah that was a slippery slope so how to like how do you balance those right because ultimately i think founders are very much afraid also about like losing an opportunity and losing the market so yeah, yeah if you want to start uh with pog like what uh, at what point do you think uh sales led motion makes sense uh or you know if if ever because ultimately you're <laughs> you're an advocate for for pog yeah no and like i i think one of the like the biggest myths with plg and maybe i helped <laughs> i guess like get people thinking about this when i like had the subtitle of my book like how to build a product that sells itself like it sounds like you don't need sales right um <laughs> A lot of people are like, yeah, it's anti-sales. Like, no, not quite. Um, but your product should be able to sell itself. Like in the self-serve motion, people should be able to buy it, get up to value on their own. Uh, now, when it comes to like, when does it make sense to potentially add sales into this equation? Uh, the question I always ask is, is sales going to add value or friction? So if it's going to be all about like a sales led motion on the front end, I always call that like usually high friction, like, okay, the only way you can buy your product is you got to talk to Wes and then you got to go through his procurement process. <laughs> and then uh, if you're lucky, we'll give you a nice invoice and uh, you can purchase and then we'll give you the product. It's like, that's a ton of friction, right? Um, on the front end. But if we look at it from a existing product led motion, where you're thinking of like, how do we layer in sales um, to accelerate some deals? A great example, uh, this is one of my favorites um, from Databox. And it was like a very simple kind of tool to understand like your dashboards, what's going on in your business metric wise. And so I was creating a company scorecard for our business where I was like, okay, we're gonna like go through this every day and every week to kind of review our numbers. Uh, and just have everything like feed into data box. And so I was trying to create like a custom metric and I was like, oh, I got to do like this weird formula thing, mix a couple of metrics. And then I was like, I don't really know how to do it. I was about to leave and then boom, pop up. Like, would you like us to do this for you? Uh, with the technical support specialist, I was like, brilliant. Yeah, actually I do. Uh, booked a call and on that call, like it wasn't even really a sales call. It was like, hey, we're just gonna set this up. And oh, by the way, like this custom, like, you know, formula stuff, that's on our pro plan. I uh, just wanted to give you the heads up on that one uh, because it is a bit more complex. I'm like, I get it. It's a very important metric we gotta attract. So makes sense, uh, happy to become a paying customer. And so where I see sales evolving is there's gonna be that first level of response where it's like, whether you call it customer success, user success, uh, onboarding coaches or whatnot, they're the people that actually accelerate you to get to value in the product so that you actually have like a really good reason to upgrade to some of those plans. You're like, oh yeah, I really want to get access to that. I want to see what that looks like. Um, then there's going to be like level two, which is, wow, okay, you're using our product quite a bit. Uh, how about we accelerate this deal and like get uh, whoever the right person or point of contact is to, to roll this out to the rest of the organization. Example with Slack. It's like, oh, your team's using Slack. That's awesome. Uh, could we roll this out to the rest of the, the company so you don't have to be pinging some people in email, pinging some people in Slack? Um, let's just get this all kind of locked down and make it easier to communicate as a team. Um, perfect example of like product-led sales working its its weight <laughs> when it comes to how do we grow these specific accounts. So um, I think, yeah, that's where I see sales evolving is like, how can we be one initially just more about like that support success focus and three, it's like, how can we really accelerate some of these really high intent deals um, and provide more value? And a lot of times that looks like being the, the champion or helping that champion, like build a business case around, okay, how do we roll this up to the rest of the company? Yeah, that, <clears throat> sorry, that makes sense. Okay. But uh, yeah, what about the other way around, right? And uh, for example, as I said at the very beginning, we started with acquiring P 
PLG companies, and now we tapped into uh, sales led more like enterprise businesses. And yeah, obviously, like just by the nature of the company, we kind of want to uh, to see what we can do on the PLG side there. So how do founders, how do companies turn their, you know, sales at motion, not turn it into PLG, no, but maybe add it to the mix, right? Start tapping into that market. Because like I said, a lot of uh, founders that went to the podcast started building with a huge customer and then thought, right. okay, maybe we're missing out somewhere. So what to do that? Yeah. So like, if you're looking to uh, like have, or if you're a sales led and then you're like, okay, we want to add like a PLG, um, into the mix, there's the very first thing you could start to do. This is more of the mindset piece is like, how do we think about using our product more than we're currently using it? So a lot of sales led companies, uh, just by the nature of like, oh, if we want to grow this amount, we're going to need this many sales reps. We got to have like all that kind of <laughs> infrastructure for those people. So it already puts in the mindset of if we want to solve a problem, it's who, not how, right? It, we need the right people on the boat to make this work. And so what's kind of dangerous about that is sales like companies can become very people heavy very quickly. Whereas product led companies by the nature, they don't necessarily have to go that route. Like they can, for instance, whenever you look at like a sales like company and how they're doing customer onboarding, you might see, oh, they have three onboarding calls with customer success. Wow, okay, that's quite, uh, one, expensive, uh, it takes a while, and the time to value for that customer is, is quite long. So what could be done with the product to make that maybe one call or maybe eventually zero calls? That'd be ideal. As long as that ideal customer feels empowered, they get it, um, and they can get the value much faster. That's all fine and dandy. So I would just look at all the activities that go into uh, acquiring, engaging, and then monetizing a customer and saying, where could we basically eliminate a ton of effort, ton of time, make it easier because, uh, the big thing that I find like product -like companies do really well is they just simplify things. It's like, oh yeah, our product onboarding, we could do that. We could guide people through step-by-step -step how to do this. Um, and a lot of times product -like companies do that because they don't have the margin on each like potential customer to support that like level of service. And so that's really the, the other thing I would, I would look at, but the first kind of piece, and this we can talk about when we get into the product led system, but the first kind of big piece I would really tackle is your overall vision and strategy. So how does PLG impact how you're going to win as a business? And I don't think a lot of people ask that question enough where it's like, they think of PLG as like a bolt on thing. Like, oh yeah, it's just for a go-to-market motion. But I always like taking it to the next level of like your strategy of like, how will this help us win? Uh, if you're in a very complex space where it's like super complex for rolling out these specific solutions. It's like, actually, if you had something that was really easy to use, um, that would be very hard to, to compete with. And that would help you win customers and simplify your business, have better margins and all that stuff. So I think those would be the first two things. Start with those like immediate quick wins where you could um, add some more efficiency from thinking about how do we approach these problems with our product? And then two, just starting off with, how does this like PLG fit into our overall company level strategy of like how we're going to win? Uh, because then it's going to kind of cascade from your strategy to the rest of your execution. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. All right. Uh, well, um, let's talk a little bit maybe about the, like the trend now what's happening right now with, with PLG companies, right? 2023, as we, established was was interesting uh so 2024 um uh 2024 what do you think is going to happen um it seems like uh serving smbs is not getting any easier right uh i think a, a lot of companies will be moving a bit more towards sales led more enterprise tickets bigger bigger contracts um yeah so what do you think about like the 
this trend? Do you see it? Because ultimately you, you work with so many companies and uh, how to, how to still be, you know, nailing the PLG in 2024. Yeah, no, definitely. So one of the like most common trends that I saw a lot in like 2023 that I see playing out a lot more in 2024 is companies getting a lot more intentional about what the heck are they going to give away for free? So we've seen this like across the board with a lot of like public product like companies where you'll see their free plans shrink. <laughs> so if you got like five gigabytes for free with something, now you get two. Uh, if you get like, I don't know, 2000 free messages, now it's like, it's a thousand. And so you just see companies kind of limiting, slowing down like the amount of free. So I see that very common. And to be fair, I think a lot of these companies did give away too much in the initial part <laughs> and everybody was doing it. So they're like, oh yeah, we got to give away that amount for free. And then they realize, oh, uh, it's now taking people like 12 to, to 24 months to, to kind of actually convert. Uh, you can't do that in this kind of market. And so you do need to have that faster kind of turnover of like, okay, they got value now. Uh, it's, it's time to, to monetize. And so I do see that window shrinking. There's going to be some companies that over index on that too, to their detriment where they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Here's a seven day free trial and you can't do anything really in the seven days. Uh, uh, but good luck and you can poke around it's like ah yeah that's like the cringe free <laughs> like okay you went a little too far there you uh, but, look, but you can touch. <laughs> maybe you'll you'll learn <laughs> yeah uh, so that's one common trend the other big common one i see is having a like rejigging your strategy so a lot of companies are still trying to do too many things and because they try to do too many things, they spread themselves thin, they have to have uh, a lot of different capabilities inside the business. And that's expensive to actually do at a really good level. And so what I see is some CEOs uh, just making the hard decisions of like, okay, this is where we're going to focus. Um, these are the key strategic decisions we need to make, uh, which is saying no to these things, saying no to that, saying maybe, okay, we don't need this team uh, if we're going that direction anymore. And then also on the other end, it's like, okay, we need to level up our standards in this specific area because it's key to our business and we need to just hire the best of the best for this specific area. So I think it really comes down to having a better strategy to win in 2024 and being really intentional with how you're going to win. And uh, that part of the free model that I kind of mentioned is like, okay, everything you do, how can we be more intentional about it? Because I think when it was 2020 or even like 2021, it was, uh, there was just a lot more cash in the market and you could afford to have a sloppy strategy, sloppy execution. Uh, people are just buying a lot easier because there was free flowing cash. And then now it's like, okay, um, I'm going to be thinking a bit more about the tools I add into my stack because we totally blew it <laughs> two years ago. Um, and now we're really looking at what are the must have tools. And so, um, if you're a nice to have tool, you get cut. Uh, so I think a lot of companies are going to be thinking more about, okay, back to that strategy, who are we a must have tool for? And let's double down on that ideal user and get very specific. And that's like, for me, that's part of like building a great strategy. You've got to be very specific about who you're building it for uh, and, and why. So those are the kind of main things I would see. Okay. So you really have to excel and plt in 2024 so are there any like uh frameworks or approaches that the companies can use uh to really successfully scale product-led businesses yeah no definitely so one of the the frameworks we've been working on for the last seven years now i call it the product-led system and so what this is is it's a holistic a go-to-market system that you can install in your business to really accelerate your growth. And so um, what we identified is there's like these nine key components that if you just focus on these nine components, implementing PLG will be like infinitely easier and you will just scale a lot faster. So regardless of if you're sales led or you're like product led, and I just want to scale this up, it'll work for you. Uh, but the very like first component we always focus in on if you're thinking about becoming PLG or scaling up existing product that business is getting super clear on your vision. So when we kind of unbundle that, that's like your vision, your mission, your strategy for your business, how you're going to win. Um, that's really 
where I feel like a lot of companies uh, struggle because it's, you can sometimes be pretty vague about that and be like, okay, we still got a good business. Uh, but if you want to build a great business, you need to have a very clear strategy. Like my best, our favorite example is always referring to like Apple. I'm like, their strategy is pretty easy to understand. It's like end to end <laughs> customer experience, vertically integrate. We own all the, the main pieces of this puzzle and it's simple. Yet the execution of it, they've executed on it to a whole nother degree. And so when you think about your business, like what is the strategy? How are you building a actual moat in your business? And I think a lot of times companies just aren't building any specific moat that makes them harder to compete with over time. And in the SaaS space, given how competitive it is now, you actually do need to build that moat. And so everything, like if you want the, the worksheets, templates and everything uh, to, to go through, build out that strategy and the rest of the other eight components, just go to uh, productled.com forward slash uh, system. It's all free, ungated. Uh, but then the next component is really identifying who your ideal user is. And so what I mean by that is like a lot of times in sales at companies, you focus a lot on your buyer. And so that buyer is going to be like, oh yeah, I'm the one like who's actually going to pay for this. But your user is the one who's like, oh, I'm going to use this product day in, day out kind of deal. And so when it comes to understanding that person, what we talk a lot about is like, do you understand what the user success is for that person? Do you understand like who, like where do they start off in that journey? What are their like main stages of that user journey? What are their big challenges throughout that journey? And like getting a very holistic picture of like, what does that look like? And then what that allows you to do, regardless if you're like a vertically or like horizontally integrated kind of SaaS company is just get super specific on who are your best customers, which ones don't churn as much. Um, and even just that alone will help you um, start growing faster because you're like, okay, we're intentional about like who we're targeting. We know like, where are those people hanging out? Are they hanging on like podcasts? Who knows? Um, and we'll just focus there and our attention directly for those ideal users. Um, the third component is all about your model. So what do you decide to give away for free? Now, if you've done the user component right, you'll have kind of like the main milestones of like, okay, people get to this point in their journey. This is a milestone for them. That's the next milestone. And what we do is we kind of break it down into like three groups. There's like your beginner group of like, oh, very beginner uh, users. And then there's like your intermediate, intermediate group, which is like, okay, they're next level up and then advanced. So what we basically decide to do is like whatever that beginner milestone is, let's say for Canva, it's <clears throat> creating a graphic for free, just as an example. It's like, okay, we're going to give you everything you need to do that for free. And so we're not discussing like, is it a free trial? Is it a reverse trial? Is it a freemium model? Like what the heck is the model? It's like, no, what would enable them to get like that outcome? Um, that's, that's much easier to kind of go through. And so those first three are really that like foundation of how do you build a scalable um, product led business? Because I find most often companies like rush into PLG and then they just skip those first three and it makes everything harder uh, because the other part of this system is every component builds off of each other. So like after your model component, uh, the next three are all about how do you build a product that sells itself? That's like phase two. And that's where you look at your offer. So like, do we have an irresistible offer? How do we really kind of like get people excited about this offer? What do we promise people? Um, then it's your experience, which is how do we actually get people to experience that offer and that value in a product? And then it's about your pricing. And so how do we create like self-serve pricing, make it easy for people to upgrade? And what's cool about this is we actually have a assessment that you can take where if you are struggling, let's say with like your user component, you will focus on that component first because it's like everything cascades from your user component. If you have, don't understand your ideal user, chances are your model's off, your offer is not hitting home for that ideal user at one bit. Uh, your experience is all over the place because you don't know who that user is, you don't have a good offer and don't even get me started with the pricing. <laughs> and so those are like the, the first six. Uh, the last three are all about like, how do you just scale this up? And so that's really where we look at your data component, which is like, do you understand like what are the big bottlenecks in your business uh, and where are people dropping off in that journey? And then it's about your process component, which is like, how do you actually uh, build or like an experimentation 
program for your business where you're basically organizing everybody to tackle that biggest bottleneck and launching like high velocity, high impact experiments every single week to tackle that. And then the last one is like, I love it because I'm like, I truly believe in product like companies you can hire as a last resort. And that's really where you start to look at, okay, now it's the time to see, okay, we've launched experiments to solve this bottleneck. And let's say for instance, it's, we have a great funnel, but we're just not getting enough users uh, to our site. It's like, okay, we got to hire somebody in marketing, uh, especially for like one of these channels or maybe a new channel to kind of build that out uh, because we need to pour more gas on this fire because we, we got something here that's actually working. And so um, altogether, those nine components, when you go through them, it just helps you focus on like, where should we focus? Because everything has that strategic order of like where you should focus on your go-to-market motion. And it takes a lot of that guessing of like, one, how to get started with PLG, but then two, like where is the highest leverage opportunity for us to focus in on as we roll this out? So yeah, I know that's big mouthful, but I just want to share that because I find a lot of companies are a little bit unfocused, a little, I mean a lot. <laughs> when it comes to rolling up PLG and this actually makes it easy. And that's the goal. Uh, yeah, okay. it was, it was a lot. You're right. Uh, but it was also like very, very, very structured. And I think, uh, yeah, if you really get into it, uh, it could be really, really helpful to focus. So what are kind of like the biggest mistakes, uh, that you see, uh, founders make when they are trying to drive growth to product? Yeah. So a lot of times the very first symptom, like when it comes to, okay, like our product that motion isn't working is they look at their free to paid conversion, right? And then they start to say, oh, like there, there's an issue here. We got to fix it. And then when it comes to how they fix it, the founders are so consistent. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, they usually think, okay, I have a low free to pay conversion rate. I must work on onboarding. Like it's the holy grail. If I make my onboarding better, if I get people to value faster, uh, this should prove out to be the case, which on the surface, that sounds amazing. Like, oh yeah, you're like bang on most times, but most times that's not actually the case. Sometimes I'll go to their website and I'll be like, huh, what do you do? <laughs> and then I'm like, huh. I still don't know what you do, even after you explained it to me. So and then awkward. I'm like, oh, oh, that's, yes. So like, if you have a bad offer, it's confusing. And then you're like, oh, I think it's an onboarding problem. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, people, one, are not motivated to sign up for this thing because they just don't understand what the heck you do. No offense to your copy writer, if you wrote the copy yourself, but it's like, that, it just needs to get fixed. Uh, and then... Two is probably like that because you're also not clear on who your ideal user is. So like go back to step two on the user component. But then a lot of times when I go to the website too, I'm like, oh, this is no different than X solution or something like that. How is this different than like Notion or whatever that other solution is? And a lot of times that's because they don't actually have a clear strategy. And when I think about it, uh, one of our like uh, students at our program, they're like going up against Eventbrite. So like everybody knows Eventbrite in the event space. You probably used it for events and different things, but their whole solution at Promotex is they're like, our strategy is two things. We are cheaper, like 20 to 30% cheaper than Eventbrite. Two, uh, we are giving people a lot more marketing tools so they can sell more tickets. So it's like, that's, that's the only thing that's different about our product. Um, and so they just like hardcore leans into that strategy with the specific ideal user. And they're not copywriters, but they saw like 47% more people signing up for their signups for their trial because of that clarity. And so that's like the most common thing. It's like, if you don't have that first phase, those first three components locked down, your product led motion will just suffer. And it will show you symptoms of like, pay attention to onboarding, but it's like, no, that's not an onboarding problem. Um, sure, it could use some help, but <laughs> don't uh, start there. Start at these earlier components. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. So I have, uh, I have a couple more questions that are a bit, you know, like a lightning round almost. Uh, and the cool. first one, you know, uh, since we started this session uh, with the question, is PLT, you know, premium or free trial? Um, and what is it for you? 
what's your ultimate favorite premium or free trial? Yeah, I am definitely like a bigger fan of freemium motions. Mm -hmm. The reason why uh, is just because I think free trials a lot of times give you these artificial time limits to just like figure out the value. But a lot of times that's not enough time to actually go through something. So yeah, there's ways to mix them, but generally speaking, freemium for me. Premium. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, well, another question is what is um, an example of business, your absolute favorite PLG business uh, that has less than 10 million ARR and why? Mm, that's a good distinction. <laughs> less than 10 million ARR. Oh man, I guess, yeah, I'm trying to think. This one's tricky on the spot. Um, <laughs> let's see. You can ditch the, no worries. Like... <laughs> I'm like looking through, <laughs> I mean like the biggest one that I know, uh, that's like a true PLG success story is like Canva. Uh, but that's definitely way over a 10 mil. Way um, over, yeah. so yeah, I don't have a good answer there right off the bat. Um, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, all the ones I, I love the most are bigger. And I think that's something to be said about to actually do this really well, you do need to get that that scale uh, for that business to, to really invest in making it super easy uh, for some of these people. So yeah, if something comes about, I'll let you know. But <laughs> right okay. now I got a boring answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you still have a few minutes to think about it. And yeah, well, uh, you know, since we um, named the session Scaling PO2 Businesses, to over eight figures, right? What is, again, like your best hack or your best like trick? There are no hacks, right? We've established that over uh, 80 episodes that we, <laughs> that we shot here. Um, but yeah, still, is there a favorite hack that helps PLG companies scale? Yeah, so it's the, I'm gonna sound a bit like a broken record here, but it is really that strategy piece. Uh, once that's locked and loaded, like when we get very specific on who we're targeting, how we're going to win, uh, what capabilities we need to have on this team to actually support that strategy. And then what are some of those like strategic choices we must make in order to usually say no to doing a lot of things. What that allows you to do is to move 10 times faster in one direction. And I always go back to, I don't know if you've read the book, uh, Essentialism by Greg McCowan. Uh, but if you haven't, there's like this uh, graph in it. And I, I've used to this in so many presentations. There's one that looks like a little circle and it's got like, I don't know, all these like one inch kind of like um, sticks sticking out of it, 10 different like one inch sticks. And it's like, that's what most organizations are like. They disperse their energy in 10 different directions in one inch. And then there's some companies that they decide to get super focused, like crazy level focus, and they go 10 inches in one direction. And so it always comes down to which company do you want to be? And almost everybody's like, oh, I want to be that, like, you know, the crazy one that goes like all in, in one direction and makes that massive progress. And let me tell you, like going up against a company that is that focused it is so friggin' hard to beat them. Like you will <laughs> really have to work hard. Even if it's a small start that goes like 10 inches in one direction, that big behemoth you're going up against uh, in your space or something like that, they're still spreading their energy in a lot of different directions. And so you still have great odds if you keep that focus. So for me, I'm just like always get super clear on that strategy first because that will have the biggest payoff in your business if you're not spreading yourself thin in so many different directions. Okay. All right. That's great. Again, uh, one more question that is kind of usual on the podcast is um, what's your biggest win and the biggest failure or the biggest challenge at your personal PLG journey? Yeah. All right. So biggest win, I would say going all in on PLG. Like there was a time where it was open view and us at product lab, like talking about PLG. And that was it. And it was just like, oh, is this really going to be a thing? Uh, and so that was 
you got definitely a big bet. Even buying the domain, productly.com, like at that time, it was like 3K. I was like, is this really going to be a thing? <laughs> now I look back at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a great decision. Uh, <laughs> good one. And so, yeah, I think back to that strategy, like my from the very beginning, is like go all in on one thing. Um, biggest failure that I think has been a humongous win for me uh, was getting fired from my one and only job. <laughs> I'm so unemployable. <laughs> um, yes, but the failure there, I guess, is, and why I say it's also a, a really great strength, is probably for the reasons I got fired, I'm an exceptional consultant uh, because I challenge ideas, because I have like a lot of great ideas when it comes to specific things. And um, that is who I am. And there's no fault in that one bit. It's just I wasn't in the right environment. And so I think whenever I look at that failure, I'm like, oh, I'm in such a better environment now. I love the people of Bitter. I'm so happy I got fired uh, from them. I like still great friends with, with all of them. But uh, when you find that environment, that is your way to 10x your life is you really have to find like, which environment do you thrive in? And sometimes that requires you to get canned. And that's a great thing. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the spirit for 2024. <laughs> But uh, yes. yeah, I think get fired, right? <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Um, then yeah. uh, you know, thanks. I, I think that's a, that's a very um, that's a very interesting session. First of all, it's a it's a great uh, vibe that you're giving. Uh, thank you for that as well. A uh, ton of great information here, great insights. Uh, so, how can listeners? Um, find you how to learn more about you and I guess you have a book coming a new one yes sometime soon so that's yeah. the time for the announcement <laughs> cool yeah I'll, I'll keep it short uh, but yeah for that new book um, it's all about that product that system that I, I talked about here because I really want to like democratize make it easier for anybody to implement BLG so that's my goal um, you can learn more about the book and stay up to date on everything at productled.com and then if you want to uh, just stay up to date on daily PLG things, just follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Wes Bush, and I post daily about all things PLG. Yeah, and it takes some effort and it's great stuff that you're posting. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Well, thank you, Wes, for, for the conversation. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. So thanks so much for being here and, you know, really excited about the book. Uh, hopefully um, going to get it soon and happy to do it again sometime. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anna. Thank you and take care.